Good, welcome everyone. My name is Rainer Kölgen and um, I'm a senior advisor with PPNC Auditores Independentes in Sao Paulo, Brazil. On behalf of the Nexia TI Business Group, I would like to welcome all of you to uh, another of our webinars. Uh, today, we will be taking a closer look at uh, emerging markets and the impact from COVID-19 and also an outlook for uh, the next year or two in certain regions and emerging markets. Uh, presentations will be held and I start with uh, my colleague Sujata Yaffer from uh, Nexia SG Tanzania. She's a managing partner uh, of Nexia SG in Tanzania and she will be speaking uh, about the East African region, um, Tanzania, Kenya and neighboring countries. Uh, Sujata is um, 13 years with Nexia SG, and she represents Nexia in Tanzania and Kenya. Uh, also with us today are Yihong Chen, my colleague from uh, Nexia TS in Singapore. He will be covering in this presentation China and the South Asian region, talk a little bit about uh, the impact of COVID in those countries, uh, and then uh, we also have today with a presentation here, Manik Abbott. He is a director with Next Time in India, and he will be covering uh, India and the region in his presentation. At the end of our presentations, we will um, have a panel discussion with like four or five uh, questions at the end. I will moderate the panel and um, we will be joined uh, by Ji Hong, by Sujata, uh, and also by Tanvir Shirolkar, uh, also from Next Time India. Um, Tanvir is responsible for the MA um, vertical activities uh, within Next Time in India. So I would um, like to start now with the first presentation. And we decided uh, to break a little bit with the ladies first principle. Um, I hope you understand that we, we, we decided to go uh, east to west starting in um, East Asia and China. So Ji Hong, the floor is yours, please. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, my name is Ji Hong. I am in Singapore. Today, uh, I'm asked to talk a little bit about COVID um, in the region of China. So uh, given the limited time we have for today, uh, I will briefly cover some points um, where I can mention some elaboration or do so. If not, um, I'll just touch and go. Next slide, please. So this is a slide. Um, that talks about the GDP growth of China between 2019 and up to the second quarter of uh, this year. So when COVID struck, that will uh, be at quarter Q4 2019 and quarter 1 2020. Well, when, when COVID strike, the Chinese took the decision to go for a hard lockdown sometime in January 2020. Uh, China locked down its uh, uh, economy and the lockdown has the effect of uh, damaging its GDP growth. As you can see in Q4 2019 to Q1 2020, the GDP growth was a negative of minus 6.8%. The lockdown in China was a rather short one, about two months or so, uh, it uh, lifted the controls and factories began to resume work. The economy started to, 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 to reboot and start to manufacture again. So from Q1 to Q2, we can see a rebound of GDP growth from a minus 6.8% to a plus 
the positive treatment, 2%. And from then on, you can see that the GDP growth continued to grow over Q3, Q4, from 3.2, 4.9, 6 6.5. And in Q1 2021, it has reached an, an, an improvement of 18.3%. That's staggering and, and that's surprising. But after that, in Q1 2021, um, the growth started to draw. As we see in Q2 2021, the growth has come down to 7.9%. That is at the end of Q2 2021. Uh, just two days or so back, um, China announced the GDP growth for Q3 2021. And the economy has been uh, slowing down, pulling off. And the latest GDP growth was at 4.9%. The current circumstances are such that the economy is not uh, doing robustly well and it's continuing to slow down. And the forecast for Q4 this year is likely to be around 4.3%. Now, um, if you were to just take a look at the COVID uh, effect on the economy, really the COVID uh, impact on the Chinese economy is not very big. You can see the V-shaped recovery between Q4 and 2019 and Q2 2020. It went down quite big and it came up quite quickly in the next quarter. Now, that's why the, the growth start to reverse in trend, uh, partly because of the new variant, Delta variant that came on to hit China sometime in uh, August this year. And that has put China back onto its uh, war path against the virus. And China adopting a uh, COVID zero policy, it means a hard lockdown for, 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 for cities or provinces where COVID is reported. So, and if that were to happen and if, variant, if Delta variant is not controlled, um, we don't really know at this point in time how the authorities are going to react to the spread of this Delta variant. Next slide, please. These are the points I mentioned just now. So the issue at hand now is that we do not know whether the Delta variant is going to cause uh, major damage or major slowdown, further slowdown to the Chinese economy. Um, this we only know as we go along and we see what, what's going to come out from China. Next slide, please. Um, on this slide, I want to just cover a little bit about uh, foreign direct investment in China. Um, in the last few years, uh, foreign direct investments have actually been uh, moving, generally moving out of China. The trend is such. Um, this happened because I guess when the economy is uh, going to mature, uh, it starts to uh, go up the value chain and uh, Companies that are uh, low cost in production will find China becoming more expensive. And generally, the trend has been some low, lower value uh, products, manufacturing start to leave China. But the uh, thing is, over 2017 and from then on to now, the slowdown is also partly due to, uh, to the trade war that we know about uh, from. 2017, 2018 onwards. And that had actually caused um, the exit, exodus, I was exodus, but the exit of foreign investments from China to, to, to speed up a bit. While the production costs in China's neighbors like uh, Vietnam and India are cheaper. And the fact is that uh, uh, factories and plants are moving out of China, some of these, especially the lower value ones going into uh, the neighbors like Vietnam and India and Southeast Asia, like Malaysia, Thailand. Um, while this is happening, 
COVID also has a role to play in, 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 in this movement. In fact, quite on the contrary, uh, what I was told on the ground is that COVID had in fact caused some of these um, investments that left China to do a U-turn and start to go back to China. The reason is they find China as a manufacturing base that is more of a, a one-stop shop where it offers a full suite of uh, uh, manufacturing uh, services uh, at different stages of production. Some of the comments we receive is that um, factories that went to the neighbor find that uh, the, the worker population there, the level of skills are not as good as in China. Likewise, for raw materials and parts and stuff like that, um, parts sometimes are not readily available. We're actually causing a disruption to a production process. So um, it is observed that during COVID, um, some of these foreign investments that left China are beginning to go back to China. Uh, next slide, please. This is what I, I just talked about. And next slide, please. And this is the slide I want to share with you, which you can see. This is um, for the period January to June 2021 this year, where it says that the increase in number of uh, investments uh, in China has actually uh, recorded positive growth. It has actually reversed in terms of uh, outflow investment to additional investments into China. So the greatest um, increase was recorded in February this year where the increase in foreign investment into China compared to the year before was 229%. And the, the other months are all record positive growth. The, the trend that uh, is observed happening in China. And this is, again, partly caused by uh, COVID. And also um, given that um, China itself has uh, its own uh, benefits and attractiveness in, in, in bringing in uh, factories or manufacturers into the, China, into the country. Next slide, please. On this slide, um, I just want to share that um, the Chinese economy is going through a change. And some of this change may actually cause some disruption to the global supply chain. After all, China is uh, known to be the world's uh, factory producing almost anything or everything from what you have at home to the heavy industries. So what happened uh, recently or this year or last, late last is that the authorities has been tightening the, the control over the economy. Climate change has caused the authorities to implement uh, climate change measures. Some of these have uh, inevitably caused disruption to its economic activity. Uh, what we have noticed in last few months is that there have been a surge in um, uh, electricity, energy uh, to power the factories. Uh, this is well seen when the, the China start to reboot its manufacturing uh, plants, where all plants get back to, to production and there was a sudden or there's a huge surge in demand for energy, both for lo local factories as well as uh, factories that came to the foreigners. And because of the core issue that, um, that now the world is, is, is facing, short of uh, coal and the price of coal has gone up, uh, China is also facing a share of uh, lack, a shortage of uh, coal to generate power for its factories and home. So as the China is going into its winter, um, demand for energy and electricity is expected to go up as that is needed to, uh, uh, to warm heating plants and for home. So if the power crunch is not addressed, 
in China anytime soon. Um, there may well be a disruption to the supply chain in the months to come. So it is something we, we, we are uh, paying much attention and, 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 and really we, we have to see how this situation will play out. And this is something that I guess will tie in or tie in very well to this topic on uh, disruption to supply chain. And on that note, I think my time should be up and that's all I have to share for now. Thank you very much. Rena, back to you. Thank you, uh, Yi Hong, um, for this interesting uh, presentation. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, there's, there's one, you know, which uh, is in the chat panel, um, fairly long one, um, regarding the um, tendency to stay in, in China, but um, I suggest we address this question during the panel at the end when we will be talking about uh, some changes in the global supply chain structure. I would like to um, hand over now to Manika Bhatt uh, from next time in India uh, to start with his presentation. Uh, thank you, Rainer. Uh, uh, namaste. Uh, greetings to everyone uh, joining us today. Uh, it was good to hear my colleague from Singapore and uh, get insights on impact of COVID-19 on the Chinese economy. I will say the situation in India is slightly different and uh, I will try to uh, share brief insights on the Indian economy re recovery uh, through the pandemic and some TRI related facts which will be of interest to many of us here. Uh, can you move to the next slide please? Yeah. Uh, numerous factors contribute to India's journey of becoming a favorable business destination. Despite the pandemic, uh, the country has cushioned the impact from the waves of COVID infections. Uh, on your screen, key recovery indicators uh, are displayed, uh, which showcase India's uh, economic recovery through the pandemic. In macro terms, uh, the GDP of the country has shown recovery and growth uh, with various estimates expecting a 9.5% growth uh, as compared to the dip of 7.3% uh, in the last year. Uh, one of the key economic indices, which is the uh, Purchasing Manager Index, uh, which maps the demand of the Indian customers, has indicated that the country has done significantly better with uh, current PMI uh, of greater than 50. As compared to last year in March 2020, the index, the index has dipped to a low of 20 point mark. Uh, with the economic uh, recovery and revival of businesses and people learning a new normal, we witnessed that the tax collections uh, reached an average growth of 6% and a peak tax collection of $19 billion uh, in April 2021. Similarly, on the FDI side, uh, I think the situation has been quite different uh, from the world. Uh, as the global FDI fell by over 40% uh, in 2020, India saw a FDI rise of around 10% on year-to-year -year basis uh, in the last year. Uh, this, this investments are primarily driven by investments in the, in the three sectors, which were uh, digital, services, and electronics. It is expected that India uh, will be a key global destination in the future and will attract uh, over $150 billion of investment uh, by 2026, so in the next three, four years uh, per se. Um, government expenditure has been instrumental in the recovery of all the economies. Uh, so India was also uh, not something different. The Indian government budgeted 13% higher expenditure for healthcare and uh, infrastructure activities to aid revival of the businesses and decrease pressure on the industry. Further such indicators uh, demonstrate the recovery and strength of the Indian economy at an overall basis. 
Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah. In this slide, uh, we'll try to share some key reforms which aided in India's recovery and also update on India's vaccination status, which uh, I believe is a big question to the world due to the large Indian uh, population. To start with the reforms, Atmanirbhar Bharat Initiative or Self-Reliant India Initiative is uh, one of the flagship initiatives by the central government. Uh, the initiative aims to promote local manufacturing and develop robust value chain, which could make India self-sufficient in, term in terms of domestic consumption. Several schemes were launched under this, uh, this flagship uh, initiative, uh, including the uh, one major scheme called production-linked incentive, uh, which through which uh, the government uh, provided uh, an outlay of $26 billion for 10 key sectors, such as uh, automobile, uh, textile, energy, food processing, uh, electronics, and several others. So it was one of the flagship uh, initiative and the government is uh, putting emphasis on the local manufacturing in India through this. Next reform was towards boosting the business activity. In uh, view of this, a massive uh, $1.4 trillion what set aside to spend on upgrading the business infrastructure in the country with the aim that this could further allow business ecosystem to thrive in the country. Government uh, also eased certain regulations to provide support to the industry during the last year. Uh, to name few, uh, they, roll, they roll out uh, the IBC, uh, uh, decriminalization of several provisions under the Companies Act, uh, they are also looking at new unified labor code, uh, just to name a few of the uh, uh, regulations which the government is looking at easing. All these have contributed to improving ease of doing business ranking for India in the last few years. During the pandemic, uh, developing connectivity and improving the communication system was of uh, paramount importance. Uh, telecom operators, electronic makers, and government stakeholders uh, designed several blueprints to provide uninterrupted digital services, which could provide considerable ease to more than a million businesses in the country. The computer sector alone received an FDI of over $25 billion in the financial year 2021, uh, which clearly highlights the growth and potential in India's uh, digital sector. As the pandemic uh, gripped India during the first wave uh, from a need assessment, the government identified that the healthcare infrastructure in the country was also in the need of an overhaul. So the, so the union government assigned highest ever budget in the history of parliament to the healthcare sector, showing the country's faith in revamping existing healthcare systems. The country, uh, through investments and several PPPs ensured that the adequate kits, drugs, and testing facilities were available not only for domestic use, but also for international use. On uh, vaccination front, uh, the number you see on the screen are some seven, eight days old, but uh, can still provide a good insights uh, on the vaccination status in India. As you can see, uh, India has fully vaccinated over 20% of its adult population and over half the population has got at least one shot of the vaccine. Sorry, uh, Ministry of Health uh, has highlighted the India's strength in its robust vaccination plan, which is aspiring to vaccinate 100% of its working workforce uh, by December 2021. So if the government is able to uh, do well with their plans, we should have everyone, all the workforce vaccinated by December 2021. I think uh, that's all for this slide. Let's move to the next slide. And uh, I will brief on the, uh, provide a brief overview of the TRI landscape in India. One of the major developments in the last few years in the TRI space has been introduction of the insolvency and bankruptcy code, which is generally called as IBC, as a sweeping reform, in, uh, as a sweeping reform which aim to revolutionize the insolvency ecosystem in India. As per the Economic Survey Report 2020, uh, IBC has significantly improved and streamlined the resolution process in India. On your screen, you will be able to view the number of filings under the IBC. A total of over 4,000 corporate insolvency resolution processes have been initiated under the IBC till March 2021, 
and nearly 2700 of them have been closed till date during uh, financial year 2021 uh, there was a sus- suspension on initiating ibc action in respect of default starting the date 25th march 2020 which was the date when the country actually went into a lockdown um, the pro- the thought was to safeguard business interest uh, during the pandemic period the suspension of the code has been lifted and ibc filings are currently active and we are seeing again seeing that the numbers are lit- slightly starting to ramp up again the framework's uh, big success during the covid phase was noted uh, when insolvency issues involving the two large companies uh, namely jet airways and videocon industries were reportedly resolved in june 2021 by the national company law tribunal yeah on the stressed asset side uh, in terms of nps the indian government has introduced a plethora of in- initiatives to combat this ever playing issue of growing nps while uh, global np average is close to 6.2% india's higher average is uh, clearly visible and we can see the steep price in this also uh, various reforms have been put in place to reduce the burden on uh, banks the introduction of bad bank concept has been welcomed as the country is in need of a significant clean up in terms of uh, bank loans uh, while this reform boost activity in the restructuring space uh, india continues to be a attractive destination for deals uh, let's learn about this in the uh, next slide next slide please yeah. the covid 19 pandemic uh, caused significant uncertainty in uh, 2020 uh, which was further compounded by global trade tensions uh, regulatory pressures and geopolitical issues despite these challenges deal activity in 2020 outperformed the previous year it was uh, evident that the global investors sentiment in india's ex- ecosystem remains intact several large deals uh, were con- were concluded uh, in the edtech healthcare and digital sector with prominent players like byju ptm reliance uh, etc in, in participating in those deals uh, new age companies are leveraging innovative uh, technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence uh, internet of things uh, big data and deep consumer insights to disrupt targeted pockets in various industries such as uh, fintech e-commerce education several startups have managed to accelerate uh, through their natural growth cycle during the keep covid era and have monetized their businesses this has enabled the country to add 16 new unicorns uh, from the start of the pandemic which is a very high number during the pandemic year it is also expected that india will further see significant investments and traction in financial services um, electronics uh, renewable energy as you can see on the see as the country aim to capitalize on the unique growth opportunities in the global market uh, i think let's move to the next slide yeah a short case study to demonstrate our recent experience of supporting a client in tri space uh, during a covid era as part of the corporate carve out transaction uh, a leading pe firm acquired certain logistic and uh, product service assets of a leading global irish company uh, which was engaged in business of electronic repair and services uh, it was a global deal and uh, a part of the deal also had the india business as uh, majority of the indian operations were non core to the pe firm and not f- profitable the acquiring group decided to wind down the india unit next time was suppo- was approached to support this winding down transition uh, to enable a smooth downsizing downsizing of the operations prior to regulatory liquidation and ensuring full visibility to the global team uh, during the wind down phase a dedicated team was deployed on site Uh, during the initial phase to assess the existing situation understand the company business operation and financial soundness and uh, thereafter build a road map as well as support and implementation of that uh, road map during the operational wind down phase the project uh, was riddled with uh, various uh, challenges uh, to name few uh, they had a adverse cash position uh, they didn't had a operational 
uh, transparency because the uh, the Indian operation director has resigned. Uh, they ha there was ambiguity uh, and they could not rely on the on the information they were getting from the Indian partners or the Indian employees they had. Uh, they had unsettled and uh, unresolved disputes uh, uh, from with uh, tax authorities, with customers, with vendors. So it was a big mess which they wanted to clear, and they wanted to do it in a very quick pace, uh, in a quick uh, manner. They also had some thousand plus employees operating in India at the time when the COVID struck and India went into a lockdown, and they wanted to actually ram that those numbers down also in the COVID year. So these were a few of the challenges which we helped them mitigate. So uh, in order to work on these challenges, uh, we provided a comprehensive project management support on various uh, critical uh, components, which included forming a receivable recovery strategy to successfully realize over 80% of the receivables, uh, diligent, diligent employee uh, ramp down plan in nine months from 1,000 workforce to nearly 20. 20, which was done in nine months. Uh, we did the financial cleanup and book reconciliation in group accounts. Uh, we advised them on the FEMA compliances. Uh, there were huge penalties which could have pop up because of the intercompany receivables which were long outstanding. Uh, and India has set on regulatory framework to ensure that those are handled smoothly. And I will say many more. In terms of share impact, our team's overall project support provided uh, the much needed transparency, uh, unbiased and thorough view of the business position, and on ground implementation support of the ramp down of our operations, especially during the COVID era, which was thoroughly appreciated by the uh, global team. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think this is all for today. Uh, happy to take questions if any. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Manik. Um, um, I don't know if we have a question from the audience. I don't see any here in, in the chat. Uh, if, um, if you allow me, Manik, I, I have um, one question towards the case study. Um, what was the reason for the company to decide about the winding down of the activities? What, what drove it? I, I understood it was not COVID. COVID just came after they made the decision. Is that correct? Yes. So, Rainer, uh, it was a known core business for them. Uh, and uh, so it, the Indian business was acquired. Also, the business was quite established. They had some thousand plus employees in India and offices in some uh, 40 cities in India, uh, but they thought that it's a non-core business for him and it got acquired as part of a global deal. And that's the reason they wanted to wind down the India operations. Okay, understood. Thank you. Um, well, it really a great, great presentation and uh, impressive numbers um, with uh, the, the number of people already vaccinated uh, and then the goal to have the the workforce fully vaccinated with two shots by uh, December of this year. So um, I wish uh, you and, and, and all your, your countrymen success in that. Um, and we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, in, in, without, without India, um, I don't know how many, if you have a number, how many vaccine doses India produced and exported. But from what I have been perceiving here in, in Latin America uh, without the production capacity of India in the uh, pharmaceutical and especially the vaccine sector, uh, we all would be in a, um, in a much worse place than we actually are. So thank you for that. No, um, I think we are all in this fight together too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's... Uh, go from India across the Indian Ocean to a little bit towards the uh, um, Southwest um, and uh, hear what Sujata um, can tell us about COVID and the impact in Tanzania, Kenya and the East African region. So please Sujata. So hello everyone and Jambo Sana everyone. Um, for those of you who have never met me, um, my name is Sujata Jaffer. 
Um, I'm the managing partner of Nexia SG Tanzania and Kenya. Um, our companies in both the countries, it's a full service firm. So we offer all audit assurance, advisory, tax and consulting services. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be given this opportunity to talk about the impact of COVID-19 in Africa and the future growth prospects. So um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, maybe we can move to the next slide. Okay, so just a quick introduction on the impact of COVID-19 in the African continent. Uh, basically, it has uh, impacted greatly. As you can see, uh, continent has entered its first recession in half a century, and the GDP is contracted by 2.1%, which is quite high. As we all know that Africa is an emerging market, and already, you know, uh, the impact of COVID has actually regressed it a little bit. So we are hoping that, uh, you know, the future outlook will help Africa to emerge and grow. The regions that were affected worst, well, obviously South Africa was the hardest hit by the pandemic and the economic contraction was 7%. Um, West Africa was estimated to have contracted by 1.5% in 2020. Um, of course, East Africa is the most resilient region um, thanks to its less reliance on primary commodities and uh, greater diversification. And the top four performers in 2021 look like uh, Djibouti is going to grow by 9.9%, Kenya, um, 5% followed by Tanzania, 4.1% and Rwanda, 3.9%. Um, the most affected sectors uh, in the African region and particularly in the East African uh, and the Sub-Saharan regions were tourism, health, uh, transport, including storage, um, remittances, obviously the trade, um, agriculture, public financing and government budgeting. Uh, these were definitely affected worst because uh, of lockdowns in our neighboring countries like Kenya, Uganda have had many lockdowns and obviously lockdowns globally. So, you know, there were no uh, trade happening between Africa and other parts of the world. It was really restricted and very much limited. And obviously the bottlenecks caused by, you know, the, the, the testing, the lack of vaccination, the uncertainty, and all of this has really impacted uh, the African region and the cross-border uh, business that went around. Particularly the tourism sector was the worst hit. And we're hoping that, uh, you know, the vaccination and the opening up of uh, the rest of the world will actually help us uh, in, uh, in our future growth. Um, next slide, please. So the Africa's uh, future growth prospects depend much on obviously the effective deployment of vaccines. It's very critical. Um, uh, the last statistics I had was that less than 2% have been vaccinated in Africa uh, because we all know that uh, you know there was shortage initially when the vaccines were produced and uh, Africa was the last to receive them. Fortunately for us now uh, we have vaccination in in the East African region and we are hoping that uh, by mid next year at least majority of um, the East African states will be vaccinated, at least the adult population. Um, the recovery trends obviously will be driven by resumption of tourism, like I had mentioned earlier, because we are very much dependent on tourism, which in turn affects the hospitality sector significantly and all the uh, businesses surrounding the tourism, the tour operators and all, they were the worst hit. So we are expecting that the opening up uh, of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the rest of the world and particularly 
recently, Tanzania is now off the red list. So that will bring in uh, tourism, obviously the rising commodity prices and uh, the rollback of pandemic related restrictions will help us in, in 2022 and onwards. The most exciting moment for Africa for post COVID recovery is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. The agreement offers opportunities for collaborative action, allowing Africans to do business with each other and strengthening Africa's resilience. So up to now, um, the African uh, continent did not trade much with, uh, with each other. And we are hoping that this agreement, which was signed uh, in uh, February 2021 by the 54 member states of the African Union, will open up uh, the trade and uh, cross-border uh, business, particularly, obviously, the tariff concessions that are you know, offered and uh, the free movement of uh, labor and uh, transfer of knowledge and technology will open up uh, the trade for the African continent. And it will even bring about opportunities for uh, trade with uh, other uh, parts of the world, particularly Europe. Uh, the most critical and enabling factor for the AFTA will be the infrastructure. So this infrastructure will uh, improve connections between and within countries. So goods and services can access market. Uh, this will create a um, liberalized market for goods and services, will enable movement of capital, will facilitate investment through creation of large uh, markets and new technology and it will boost productivity and this uh, eventually the elimination of tariffs on intra-African trade will uh, facilitate trade and growth in the market. Um, next slide, please. So just talking briefly about the outlook and risks uh, in Tanzania and Zanzibar to begin with, and then I'll talk about Kenya and Uganda and other regions. So the economic outlook, um, looks positive. Uh, we are expecting a GDP growth of 4.1% in 2021 and 5.8% in 2022 uh, due to improved performance of the tourism sector and the reopening of trade corridors. Energy and fuel price increases are expected to persist in 2021, raising overall inflation to 3.9% in 21 and 3.4% in 22. Uh, spending on large infrastructure projects, obviously, and the depressed revenue performance are expected to widen the fiscal deficit. And the major downside risk to the outlook includes business regulatory bottlenecks that constrain private sector activity and uncertainties regarding the pandemic. Um, next slide, please. So these are the sectors in which there are opportunities, both in Tanzania and Zanzibar. I'll just quickly take them through because of lack of time. So it's mining and gas, oil exploration, road construction, tourism and hospitality and telecom. Um, same goes for Zanzibar and Pemba. There are a lot of opportunities that have opened up investment in the following sectors, particularly now uh, like Zanzibar and Pemba are offering small islands uh, which are available on long leases. Fisheries is being uh, promoted and Zanzibar has introduced Zanzibar Investment Promotion Authority to facilitate private sector investment. Next slide, please. So Kenya, Kenya was uh, greatly affected by COVID due to lockdowns. The expected growth in, 21, in 2020 is 1.4, obviously that's passed now and the country relies on local demand, which was also subdued. The government has borrowed heavily and the public debt has really gone up. Um, the overall outlook still looks good, um, particularly uh, in 2021 and 2022. Uganda has been the most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic due to several lockdowns 
tourism and hospitality has been severely affected and government had to borrow as revenue collections had gone down. Overall outlook looks challenging. Next slide, please. Thank you. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Sujata. Let's uh, see if we have questions here from the audience. Um, anyone with a question for Sujata? It appears no. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sujata. What, what I really find um, uh, interesting and which for probably most people in uh, at least the, the Northern Hemisphere went um, unnoticed or at least um, in, in the business community is the creation of this huge uh, free trade zone, uh, which uh, I think is, is great news. Um, do you know if there are already any negotiations between uh, that free trade zone in the African Union and uh, the European Union or maybe the North American free trade zones underway? So uh, the African Union, obviously the fact that all the 54 uh, African states have signed the agreement, which is a very positive move because uh, as, as we, we know that even pre-COVID, um, US and China was at trade war and that had already weakened the, the supply chain mm -hmm. and then the COVID-19 impacted further. So I think everybody was looking at uh, sort of uh, redirecting and reviewing the supply chain. And uh, so the creation of this uh, uh, African uh, free trade, uh, uh, African continental free trade agreement in African states will sort of uh, uh, focusing on uh, promoting trade and uh, looking at uh, uh, how the supply chain can be uh, managed within mm -hmm. the African continent. And of course, uh, even looking at Europe because uh, many of the African countries are exporting to Europe and are importing uh, from Europe and uh, other, other parts of the world, as you know, uh, China was uh, one of the second largest trade partner for uh, Africa and particularly Tanzania. And, and uh, due to the COVID-19 impact and the supply chain disruption, now Africa is, is re-looking at uh, forging a partnership with Europe. And we are hoping that this uh, trade agreement will sort of help uh, in forging the partnership between Africa and Europe, which particularly uh, Europe where they're looking at uh, labor intensive sectors, uh, I think Africa would uh, prove to be a good investment as uh, you know, it will enable um, low cost uh, skilled labor. And uh, also it will uh, help in uh, economic development of Africa uh, and that means the wealthier Africa, meaning a larger market for Europe for trade. So that is kind of a positive move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we will hear more uh, about this African uh, um, free trade zone uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, and it will be really interesting to see how Africa will position itself uh, between the various already existing trade blocks. Um, so um, I would now um, like to welcome Tanvir Shirokar uh, for the panel uh, as well as uh, Yihong Chan. We have a couple of questions. We, we have like, uh, I think, 20 minutes left for um, the panel discussion. Um, with a couple of questions, and uh, if uh, someone from the audience would like to add a question or two, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, so we um, we will uh, talk about that as well. Um, next slide, please. 
Good. The uh, first question that I have, I would like to uh, to direct to Yihong and the Asian region, um, because in the uh, presentation from India, we learned that by uh, December, uh, the workforce will be fully vaccinated, and Sujata had the uh, the two percent current level and a forecast for maybe mid next year. Yehong, uh, according to um, a recent publication uh, from Bloomberg, uh, about 70% of the total population in China seems to have been fully vaccinated uh, twice. So that's already a, a high number. But how is the situation in uh, Southeast Asia? Countries like Vietnam, Thailand, the Philippines, can you give us any insight on where they are on the vaccination spectrum? Um, okay. Now, uh, I don't have uh, exact details, but um, what I remember is that uh, uh, Thailand is, is, is uh, increasing its uh, vaccination rate. Um, I think they are not 50% yet, right? And um, for Malaysia, it's quite advanced. It's almost 80% also. Singapore is 84% um, of the uh, population has been vaccinated, right? And um, uh, generally at different degrees, but um, I would say that uh, uh, countries are ramping up their vaccination rate. So I, I, I can make a guess that uh, maybe by end of the year, uh, most countries should uh, at least more than 50% uh, vaccination rate for Southeast Asia countries. Okay, thank you. Um, then let's maybe uh, move to the uh, second question. Um, we, we have seen obviously in the various regions and markets uh, mounting debt on the government side uh, for the public sector giving uh, loan programs or uh, social assistance to the population paying for vaccines but we have also seen raising debt on the company levels uh, getting through um, the COVID um, pandemic and uh, making sure there is enough uh, cash in in the accounts. Um, obviously that has led to, uh, in certain cases, uh, an increase in non-performing loans and assets, uh, which will have to be worked out. Uh, just going back to the presentation we saw from India, uh, I think one number there, if I saw that correctly, was an amount of about a hundred and billion uh, in, in debt, bad debt, basically, uh, which has to be worked out over the next um, couple of months and, and quarters. So how has this um, trend and then the situation uh, shaped recently for distressed assets and maybe somewhere you uh, can elaborate on the, uh, the situation and also the opportunities maybe for distressed investments in India, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, traditionally, uh, for lenders in India, the recovery was collateral based. Okay, so you go and lock the factories, and then you there is a process to recover those assets. But with the advent of insolvency and uh, bankruptcy code, which we call IBC, uh, the creditors could now tap the enterprise value of the company. Okay, so this code provides for a time bound resolution uh, with a predefined waterfall. Uh, for different types of creditors. Uh, in fact, IBC uh, has helped to improve the recovery rate from 26% uh, uh, as we could uh, see in the earlier regime uh, to 43%. And the uh, recovery time has also reduced from four to six years to one to two years. So this has a huge positive uh, implication for distressed uh, debt uh, investors. Uh, just to give an example, SR Steel, uh, 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 you know, was in a debt and the debt was around uh, $7 billion uh, uh, and the liquidation value was around 
2.5 billion dollars but with ibc uh, process there was a sale to strategic investors and that could garner around 6 billion dollars for the creditors so you see the ibc has uh, played a major role in uh, unclogging uh, uh, banks balance sheets and uh, you know and pushing it for reallocation of capital for more efficient use Uh, so as the ibc is evolving uh, we see that the acquisitions of uh, distressed assets uh, uh, is increasing and uh, because the investors are getting more valuable and high quality assets at a discounted value uh, so uh, just to give an example in mid 2017 there were 12 large accounts uh, which went under ibc process and nine qualified for liquidity uh, mergers and acquisitions and fetched a worthwhile uh, recoveries from the bank's perspective okay so we also see recently investments from few international players prior to prior to equity and pension funds uh, who have shown interest in investing in distressed assets so the distressed assets situation was not just on account of covid in fact it was before covid also but covid increased this uh, stress uh, but at the same time there were policy and regulatory measures from the government to revive the negative effects and preserve the financial stability uh, like uh, increasing the moratorium of de- on debt repayments uh, policies in regards to asset class reclassification norms and then expanding liquidity in the system to resolve the uh, normalcy i just also want to highlight some uh, challenges uh, faced in m and a of distressed assets and what are the opportunities for the investors so basically there are valuation challenges uh, valuation of assets that needs to be adequately insulated from the promoters and the owners because normally they use uh, proxies to uh, derail the bidding process or jack up the valuations uh, the speed is cr- uh, very critical at the same time you need to retain the employees uh, you need a, a proper plan to Uh, you know how to uh, make the uh, company profits uh, or turn around the company in uh, future and you also need to assess the reputational damage with uh, which has been caused uh, uh, with key vendors and customers in terms of opportunities uh, uh, you know acquiring this distressed assets would uh, give uh, the companies uh, acquisitions of uh, Uh, employees or talent or business processes uh, expanding customer base and of course you get a value uh, at a very discounted price so yes the stage is set uh, for uh, investors with patient capital looking to invest in indian stress assets space as the regulatory framework has evolved and the risk return profile is quite attractive yeah okay thank uh thank you so much tanvir uh it's interesting to to hear that the recovery rate has uh, risen uh substantially on on the outstanding debt uh, that's really impressive so shafa um can you maybe in in a minute or two briefly talk a little bit about anything you have seen in distressed asset investments in east africa is there a lot of activity or is it still building up okay so in 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 tanzania in particular um the distress assets uh, have definitely increased due to covid-19 impact but um so similar to the situation in in india it is offering uh, good uh, assets at a very good quality assets at a very reasonable price as opposed to in the past but uh, the investment in these assets at the moment is very very slow uh, because uh, like i mentioned that uh, uh, africa and particularly east africa has been impacted uh, um, a lot so people are kind of uh, holding on and they are not investing that much but uh, obviously Uh, the financial institutions the banks and all have been affected badly and the bad debts have increased so uh, that has caused financial strain uh, unfortunately there has been no support from the government so the situation is still like you know um, critical but we are hoping that uh, you know the opening up of the market and the change in policy and 
you know, our government is trying to put in place uh, incentives for attracting foreign investments and creating an enabling environment and, and that will help in uh, reviving the sectors. But obviously there has been uh, quite a lot of, um, you know, insolvencies due to that. And uh, particularly the tourism sector, the hospitality sector has been affected a lot. Uh, and um, so, but this has also encouraged mergers and acquisitions and therefore creating opportunities for us in the form of for carrying out due diligence, uh, particularly at the time of mergers and acquisitions. And obviously, uh, you know, that has created opportunities for us in um, as, as consultants, you know, to provide that support. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, well, um, besides the, uh, the distressed asset investment, um, how do you both, uh, let, let's talk a little bit more about India and then um, East Africa. Um, what about other investment areas and trends that you see once, let's say, COVID is, is behind us? In, like whenever it, it, it will be in the region, maybe 2022, 23, 24. Um, where do you see the focus of, of foreign direct investment going? Yeah, Is that the so for 10 minutes, yeah. Please? yeah, in terms of India, the emerging trends, you know, uh, in fact, the companies after post COVID are working towards making their supply chain more resilient and even the production systems. Uh, because of travel rest restrictions and social distancing norms, we see, uh, you know, uh, advanced technologies are being used to serve the people. Uh, so in terms of opportunities for investments, uh, sector wise, first is healthcare technology and infrastructure. Uh, because uh, this sector needs upgradation at every level, right from infrastructure development to delivery to process management. And there is already a green signal by the government uh, to telemedicine and doors doorstep uh, drug delivery uh, so which has thrown a lot of opportunities for investment in this sector uh, there is use of artificial intelligence robotics right so all these things are uh, making this sector very attractive second was automotive and there is a transition uh, from to hybrid or electric vehicles so that is the area where we see a lot of uh, investments and collaborations uh, India is also becoming a hotspot for offshoring of automotive design and engineering services uh, and uh, being, favor, uh, being seen as a favored, uh, favored sourcing destinations for automotive components uh, for various international companies. Uh, the third is retail. Uh, in fact, retail is one sector which is affected both positive and negative uh, ways. Uh, the longer the COVID, I think the greater the chance to, you know, to move to online and omni-channel purchasing. And uh, there we are seeing a lot of uh, deals happening. Uh, electronics, uh, uh, basically India depends a lot of, on China for batteries and e-vehicles. Uh, but uh, government is also pushing for local uh, manufacturing and uh, there are incentives being offered. So there is immense potential for manufacturing of such products for captive consumption also and for a base for exports also. Then there is education technology and vocational training uh, where, where we see a lot of deals. Insurance is one sector because large population of India is without any insurance. Uh, so and the crisis of this scale has increased the need to obtain insurance. Sure. Uh, so yeah. we see significant yeah. uptick yeah, in this sector. Uh, Tanvir, excuse me that I that I interrupt, but I'm getting here a signal that we have only uh, four minutes left. Absolutely. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I would like to, uh, the, the next two questions combine into one. Um, uh, there's a lot of publication and, and, and talk about the supply chain disruptions. Um, there, there are empty shelves uh, in, in some supermarkets and, and hyper stores um, in, in the US and, and sometimes uh, even in Europe um, due to COVID. Uh, there has been a halt in some car manufacturing plants uh, in Europe, North America, and even here in Brazil because of missing uh, semiconductor uh, and, and, and electronic elements and chips. Um, what I found in Gihong, um, maybe that 
is a question uh, for your region. Uh, what, what I really found interesting is uh, the trend that before COVID, some foreign direct investment left China, um, went to maybe Vietnam, uh, Thailand, or, or other uh, countries in the region. And that the trend then really turned around during COVID. So you have more uh, companies opening uh, in, in China with foreign direct investments. Um, my question here is, how do you see that over like the next three, four years? Was this just a short reaction due to COVID? Or do you think that will be continuing? Um, and then the second, and you talked a little bit about this in your presentation about the energy mix um, and the um, problems that might appear here. Um, I don't want to force you to give a weather forecast for Beijing in February next year, but maybe you can elaborate of some of the things that we talked before, which for most of us uh, are not really on our daily radar screen. Please, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So um, maybe I, I take your second question first, um, which is on the energy part of things, right? Um, uh, well, um, um, China has uh, embarked on the, on the, on the climate uh, change measures to, to bring down the carbon emission. So it has set an uh, uh, ambitious uh, target to um, become carbon neutral uh, by 2060. Um, that, that target may have to shift because, as we can see from COVID, um, the cost major supply disruptions and, 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 and people are now looking at how to uh, ramp up or how to get back um, to their production level. So the uh, obvious um, solution is, look, if I had been doing well in, in China, uh, China being a reliable manufacturer, and in order to meet my demand from my customers, the obvious um, answer is to get back to uh, your uh, manufacturing plants in China. So, and therefore, uh, plants are moving back to uh, uh, China. So, in terms of, of, of um, the weather and, and the energy thing, um, uh, because February next year it's um, going to be the Winter Olympics. So uh, China is going to hold the Winter Olympics. Obviously, it wants to project a clear sky and a good host. And the last thing you want to see is fog all over the place. So, um, and because it is China, I mean, if the government says do something, everybody would do. And, and what I observe is that, uh, like what I observe in 2008, the Beijing Olympics, um, the authorities practically uh, flush the streets, uh, water jet the streets, and, and shut all the factories that uh, produce a lot of carbon and stuff like that, just to make sure that the sky is clear. So what I heard is uh, that 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 will kind of support the government policy now to to try and bring down the, the the burning of coal and stuff like that. But again, that it runs against um, this uh, supply chain disruption uh, objective. So government, I read and I was told that this just very recently the authorities have reversed again its uh, policy to ask um, the coal to continue to produce more coal and, uh, uh, and the companies to, to burn more coal so that more energy is uh, uh, produced and, and so that factories can work. So uh, the, the authority is trying to make sure that uh, all this shortage in supply will be met uh, from, from now. And in terms of the change in the uh, the supply chain structure, uh, I can't see, be, can't retail beyond five years, but I think for the next two, three years at least, and assuming COVID is still with us, um, any prudent uh, producer or manufacturer would want to be a, a, a reliable supplier of goods. So the obvious um, solution might well be to continue um, uh, production in China. So that, that would be my, my, my view, maybe at least for the next two, three years. Okay, thank you uh, so much, Yi Hong, uh, for, for your view on this. Um, and um, I, I certainly agree that COVID will still be with us for 
longer than we all want. Um, and so two, two, three years is probably a very realistic time frame uh, until it's really, um, I don't want to say disappearing, it will go from a pandemic to a more endemic uh, virus, but just uh, looking at uh, vaccination uh, progress in, in Africa that still has to uh, get to a level where Asia and Europe are, booster shots, then we're very uh, quickly in the year 2023. Um, and probably supply chain disruptions will be with us for a couple of um, quarters or maybe two, two years until everything will sort itself out. Um, I want to, uh, given that we are uh, two minutes before the end of our planned uh, time, uh, see if we have any questions from the audience for the panelists. Anyone with a question? No, apparently not. Uh, then I would like to thank very much Sujata Tanvir, Yi Hong, and Monique for their presentations and the participation in uh, the panel. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, there is a feedback link here in the chat box. So if um, you would like to give us feedback, we would very much appreciate this. Um, the recording of this webinar will be available on Nexus website in we will let you know by email uh, once we upload both the recording and then also the presentations to the website. Thank you so much. And you all have a good day or a good night, depending on where you are. Bye-bye.